Good afternoon and welcome. I am Allison Sutton, the program manager with the Black Metropolis Research Consortium. For those of you who are not familiar with this, but have joined us today, the Black Metropolis Research Consortium, or as we call it, the BMRC, is a Chicago-based membership association of libraries, universities, museums, community arts organizations, and other archival institutions or repositories. The BMRC's mission is to connect all who seek to document, share, understand, and preserve Black experiences with a particular focus on Chicago, <clears throat> but beyond as well. So in my role with the consortium, I oversee our two primary educational initiatives. One of them is the Summer Short-Term Fellowship, a, um, a program that has attracted scholars, writers, artists, musicians um, from all over the country and other parts of the world. So since 2009, the first year we started the program, we have hosted more than 100 fellows each summer for a one month residency here in Chicago. After their time here um, conducting research, it is customary that they share their work in a presentation. So today we will hear from one of our seven 2022 fellows, Brandon Stokes, and after Brandon's presentation, he will be joined by our discussant, Dr. Um, Lionel Kimball, who is an associate professor of history at Chicago State University. And I will uh, introduce him more fully later. So now to share a little bit about our fellow, our speaker today, Brandon Stokes. He is a, a doctoral candidate in the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies um, at the University of Massachusetts excuse me, <laughs> at Indiana <laughs> University, Bloomington, my, my apologies. His research focuses on housing and ur urban development concerning African-Americans on Chicago's South Side with an emphasis on the intersection of race and class. Presently, Brandon is the instructor for the Atkins Living Learning Center's foundational course and a 2021-2022 H-A-S-T-A-C scholar for Indiana University's Institute for Digital Arts and Humanities. Additionally, Brandon volunteers writing grants, writing grants for 360 Nation, a Chicago-based nonprofit focused on urban agriculture, youth development, and community re revitalization. So Brandon, I will stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. Hang on just a moment. Mm. Okay, wait a minute. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, so I will start by sharing my screen. Let's hope this uh, goes well, there are no hiccups. All right, can everyone see my slide? Yes. Okay, all right, so the title of my project is A Divided Bronzeville, How Race and Class Created Separate Housing Institutions for African-Americans in the Black Metropolis. And once again, I'm Brandon Stokes. So here's an overview of, the, of my presentation today. I'm gonna to give you first a background on my research and why I'm, why I'm interested in it. Then I'll go over what I did this summer. So all of the archival findings from the University of Chicago archives, the University of Illinois at Chicago UIC archives, the Chicago History Museum and their research center and their archival collection, and the Vivian Harsh Collection at the Chicago Public Library's Carter G. Woodson Library, located on Chicago's South Side. And after that, I'm gonna give you a brief uh, demonstration of what I did with some of the archival material that I found and the data that I gathered with, that I used with the uh, Indiana University's Institute for Digital Humanities create a data visualization project, which is still in progress, but I think it's going to be 
great once it's presented <laughs> fully and completed. And finally, I'm gonna end this presentation with why. Why is this work that I'm doing important? Why did I devote years of my life to this? And so without further ado, let's get started. So background of my project. So I'm here to, I want to, exp I am exploring the Chicago neighborhood of Bronzeville and its history throughout the decades with, with things, finding information on economic and social mobility. With, the, with my goal at the, at the completion of this project is to investigate the public housing complex of the Clarence Darrell Homes, this public housing development and the Lake Meadows apartment community built by developers, the New York Life Insurance Company and with, in consultation with the real estate company, Dramer and Kramer. And I'm going to highlight the differences from the decades and activate a movie timeline that visually illustrate illustrating how Bronzeville has changed. So I began this project. It started when I was at Chicago State University in the history department, uh, writing my thesis. And my thesis was on housing in Chicago in Bronzeville from 1910 to 1950, looking at the Great Migration and the tenement housing in Chicago and the kitchenette apartments and how that all changed and the development of housing and the end of restrictive covenants. So I became interested in that after writing my thesis. Then I matriculated to Indiana University in the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies. And through many courses that I took, I became interested, I kept my interest in housing in Chicago. So one, one book that I was reading that I because of my class with Dr. Valerie Grimm when I was doing a, uh, a bibliography, a annotated bibliography. Uh, it was one book called The Blueprint for Disaster by uh, Brad Hunt, who was the uh, chair of history at Loyola, Loyola University, Chicago. So I, I emailed him and we, he invited me out to lunch and we had lunch and we discussed, you know, housing in Bronzeville, public housing especially, and he told me, he was like, well, I've already written a book on public housing and there's a lot of research on that. What is something that you're interested in that can break new ground? And we, do, we ended up talking about Lake Meadows and he was just like, well, there's, there's not a lot that's been written on that. That could be a way for you to forge new paths. And I thought about it, I'm like, I'm still interested in public housing. Maybe I can do a, a comparison study using Lake Meadows and a public housing complex. And I was like, what's a, what's a close public housing complex to Lake Meadows? And I'm like, how about the Daryl Homes? The Daryl Homes are in, are, by, are in Bronzeville, they're by the lake. And there's a lot of history there, a lot of, a lot of negative history, but there's a lot of history there. So that started my, my project. So eventually I applied for the BMRC fellowship and they graciously awarded it to me and I'm still very thankful for that. And so this past summer, I went to many archives, spent many hours in them with my with these headphones on to understand about housing in Bronzeville. So let me tell you about my first trip, which was to the University of Chicago archives. So the first archive that I went to was the University of Chicago archives and, and I focused on the Ferdinand Kramer papers. So the Ferdinand Kramer was the founder of the real estate company Draper and Kramer, and they consulted with the New York Life Insurance Company on development and the final completion of Lake Meadows by, in 1960. And eventually they bought uh, Lake Meadows in 1969, and they're still the owners of it today. And the big process in Ferdinand Kramer's papers, he wanted to secure housing the true land in Chicago for middle-class housing. And in, in, well, in the Bronzeville area at the time, there are many slums. So he was in the process of slum clearing and housing development. And he was looked upon as almost as an integrationist at this time, because he was building middle-class housing that was irrespective to the race of the tenants more about securing good, strong families to live in a, an integrated community. But going through his archives, I noticed there were some things that were 
that, di that did not paint him as a light as this great integrator or were kind of suspicious in how he viewed predominantly African-American communities. So I'm going to read a brief letter that he wrote to Tom Hughes, who was the executive vice president of the Chicago Real Estate Board. And this was in 1978 when there was, the HUD was interpreting that the Housing Act of 1968 not only went to uh, housing developers, also apartment and real estate developers. And in this letter that he wrote to Mr. Hughes, he said that when I read the article in the Illinois Realtor dated April 1978, I was amazed to find that the Illinois Association of Realtors and the National Association of Realtors bought HUD's interpretation of the Open Housing Act, when it, when it really means that these organizations are in favor of extending the ghetto and creating new pockets of the ghetto. I would have hoped that these organizations and Chicago Real Estate Board would back up those who believe that when the Congress passed open housing legislation, they did so with the intent of fostering integration. Now, I read that and I interpret that. You can interpret that two ways, that he's really about integration, integrating housing, but he's also interpreting that maybe predominantly African-American areas will become ghettos. So I started looking through more of his papers and trying to see if he said anything about all white areas becoming negative and that's a reason for that, but I couldn't find anything in his papers outside of he's saying that if you're if allowed to, all white areas would stay all white. So that gave me a little bit of pause to, to really evaluate the meaning of Lake Meadows. So the next archive that I visited was the University of Illinois at Chicago, their archives. During my time here, I specifically focused on the Metropolitan Housing Council's papers and the Chicago Urban League papers. So the Metropolitan Housing Council was really about fair housing and slum clearance. So they were founded in 1934, and their first director was Elizabeth Wood, who would go on to be the first executive secretary of the Chicago Housing Authority. And they were fought to slum clear and to build good housing. And eventually they moved on to becoming advocates for rehabilitating public housing, getting housing up to, uh, to code and providing subsidized housing for the poor in Chicago. Additionally, when I looked at the Chicago Urban League papers, they're also about housing advocacy for the economically challenged. They were very integral in working with the Poor People's Campaign, the Poor People's Campaign being an arm of Martin Luther King's plan of attacking poverty and housing and housing problems in the North. And as I, I, I used an image from a research report they did on public housing called Public Housing, Chicago Builds the Ghetto, where in this report, they highlighted how as the race of people in public housing shifted to being predominantly African-American in Chicago's house, housing authority, that the design of public housing changed. It was, it was no longer being built to sustain families, but being built to just hold as many people as possible. So that, that kind of helping me in my research right now and seeing how public housing has negatively affected African-Americans and when we look at the history of Black Chicago. So the next uh, archive that I went to was the Chicago History Museum and their research center. The, how, the Chicago History Museum houses the entire developmental records of the Chicago Housing Authority. So I, there were many, many reports about how all, all of the Chicago housing properties were developed from the west side to the north side and specifically on the south side. And there was one report on, from the 1980s on the Daryl Homes and their rehabilitation. So I have this photo here, which is of uh, 706 East 38th Street on the Daryl Homes. This is an apartment on the eighth floor. As you can see, it's, there's graffiti, it's dirty, the, it's damaged to the building, it's very hard brick. And this is just showing how the Daryl homes were constructed and what the CHA was trying to do in the 1980s as far as trying to rehabilitate this area. So this comes from a report I read where they were 
in consultation with not only with the Metropolitan Housing Council, but also with residents on what they can do to make the Daryl homes more habitable for families. And finally, the Vivian Harsh Archive. So I visited the Vism Archives on Chicago South Side, Carnegie Woodson Library. So the first thing I went to was the Timuel Black papers. Now, Timuel Black, who passed away last year, was, I call him the father of Black Chicago history because he has been here since the first great migration and he has studied and amplified anything that happens with Black Chicago. Timio Black has had his hands on it. So I read, I read through his archives and I looked at many of the things he did at and for how, advocacy for housing in Bronzeville, specifically many meetings and com community meetings that he held at the Abraham Lincoln Center, which was on the corner of 39th and Cottage Grove and was right next to, was right next to the uh, Daryl Holmes. And I also looked through the Edward Holmgren papers, which he was one of the, worked under Elizabeth Wood, who became the first secretary of the Chicago Housing Authority. And they worked with each other and he supported her in her goal to push integrated housing. And when the mayor and the Chicago City Council uh, stopped and removed Black fam families from integrated housing, he ended up quitting Chicago Housing Authority. And I read through many of his correspondence with uh, Elizabeth Wood and their frustration with the city and their aversion to integrated housing. And additionally, I also looked through the Sherry Lockett papers and she had a lot of things about the planning and development of not only Bronzeville, but Lake Meadows. In this photo, this is one of the, from the first year at Lake Meadows and the development, the pictures of the apartments, the kind of families that moved in and married couples, professionals who moved in there. And finally, the most interesting thing, which many people won't because it's just a bunch of numbers. I looked at the census records from the local community fact book at, that were in the Vivian Harsh archives. And I have to really thank them for having these records available. And also when one year of the census, one decade of the census records was missing from the archives, they pushed me to the Harold Washington branch, which actually held it so I can complete my study and of, of these records. So I'm gonna stop this right now because I wanna go into some data visualization that I did using the census records. So there are two tools that I use. One is Tableau, which is a online uh, data visualization software. If you wanna buy a license, it's very expensive, but if you have the money, I would, I would definitely buy it. And also a GIS mapping. And I use this all with a project, with my research project in consultation with the uh, Institute for Digital Humanities at Indiana University. So I'm gonna stop sharing right now and switch over to Tableau and show you some of the data visualization that I've been doing. So give me one second to reshare my screen and I will show you Tableau. So this is Tableau. So Tableau is a digital visualization software where you can use uh, data points either from Excel or SQL, Python, if you're afraid of you data nerds out there. But I, I was able to take a PDF of the local community fact book and I transferred them to Excel sheets and working in consultation with Ida, I was able to create these uh, heat maps. So I used uh, two community areas. So Douglas, which is where Lake Meadows is and Oakland, which is where Daryl Holmes is. And I was able to find a, both census tracts of where exactly where these housing uh, developments were. So I was able to look at income, compare income data. As you can see, income below the poverty level was very high in the Daryl homes, very low in, in the Lake Meadows. See, you can look at median uh, income data. It was, it was steadily growing for Douglas and it was a very slow climb 
for uh, the Daryl homes and also with unemployment. So there's very low unemployment in Lake Meadows, very high unemployment in the Daryl homes, especially in 1990. So going through the, the uh, Chicago Housing Authority archives, I was able to compare this data so to what I was reading in the 1990s, what was happening, there was a uh, redevelopment. There was, there was, there was reform. They were shutting down the Daryl homes because of this, because of the low employment, because of the low education, the low economic data. So with that, I was able to create this, but this was the only thing I was able to create. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna show you one more thing I created, which was a GIS map with my team at uh, Ida. So give me one second and here we go. So this is a, a kind of a GIS story map that I created exploring Bronzeville with my team and my data analyst, uh, Kelly Bosworth, who's a doctoral candidate in our ethnomusicology uh, department at Indiana University. So she was on Team Stokes. We're great. So this is how it begins. I'm telling you the story of Bronzeville. And I, I and additionally, I also have a product, a product that I did with with uh, Ida before for the hashtag, which uh, Ms. Sutton alluded to was this project was an oral history project. And I eventually I'll be adding some of my oral history project to this uh, story map. So you'll hear the actual voices of people who lived in both Lake Meadows and Daryl Homes. So with this, I have a spatial map, which is uh, shows you Lake Meadows, where it is. You got pictures of Lake Meadows and the Daryl Homes showing economic mobility. I have a screenshot of the tableau so you can see the economic differences in the economic and social mobility or lack thereof. And also I created a, a heat map of community resources. So red dots representing black owned businesses, orange, blue dots representing churches, orange dots representing hospitals. And the purple dot represents the Abraham Lincoln Center, which was a source of community pride for uh, the Daryl Homes. So you can see I'll be adding more to this over time, but I also wanna thank the Chicago Vivian Hart collection for giving me all of that data up until the year 2000, which is great, which has allowed me to make these grants. So I wanna thank Lance Green Hogue, who helped me with the maps, Kelly Bosworth, who helped me with the map, the data, and everyone at the IU Digital Humanities Department, Kalani Craig, Michelle Dalamu, Vanessa, Elias, my, my, my man, uh, Puyan, Sean Perso, Chris Rosser, they're all great. So that's a brief demonstration on data visualization. So I'm gonna go back to uh, the PowerPoint to show you my last thing, which is I think probably one of the most important parts of this is why does this matter? Well, one, this matters because one, Timmy O'Black's the father of uh, Black Chicago and he wanted to make sure that the history of Black Chicago always stayed together. Uh, Harold Lucas, who recently passed away, was a master in wanting to, wanting to keep Bronzeville alive. And also Danton Floyd. Danton Floyd is the founder of 360 Nation, who I volunteer for. And he's also a doctoral candidate at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And he studies the, uh, the history of the West Side and West Side production. And he has a thing he calls the 290 epistemology, where he talks about the culture and the pride of the West Side of Chicago and why that can't be erased and why that can't be ignored and why, why it matters. It matters because these are real people living real lives. And this erasure cannot happen. If we ignore what happened in the past, then we won't be able to inform what is happening in the present or be able to help for the future or be able to help plan for the future. And finally, the reason why this matters is because the humanities matter. You know, I know there's a push in academia that says, you know, we we can, we don't, academia doesn't, humanities don't really matter anymore. It's all about STEM. It's all about STEM. That's all we're going to push. We're going to push for STEM. We're going to push for business. But the humanities matter 
The humanities matter because they inform us of what's happening. They, they inform us about people, about culture, and why that matters and why everything doesn't happen in a vacuum. These things happen through intercommunication, interlocking narrative that works together. STEM works with the humanities, which works with the social sciences. This all matters. And this, and this also matters because although I am trained as a historian, I do black studies and black studies matters. Black studies matters, not because we're just, it's something you can, it's good to say, or because one day I wanna get tenure and write a book that nobody reads. It matters to me because I do black studies because black studies is just not a discipline. Black studies is a repositioning of power. It's, it is allowing, it's giving voice to the previous voiceless. It is, it is saying, it is repositioning the power from people being objectified to they're actually being the subject of their lived realities. And I'm sorry for being passionate about that, but I'm, I love black studies, that's what I do. I would do this if I wasn't in academia. And I'm gonna continue to do this no matter what else I do in my life. Black studies matters, black Chicago matters. And um, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I was on mute. I was muted. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate your passion, Brandon. Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing um, such interesting and I guess a little bit little known um, history about housing in, in the Brownsville area and some things that certainly we, we would generally not know. And as a researcher, you've uh, shared some important information with us. We appreciate it. Um, so it's now time for our guided discussion and Q&A period. Um, could. So we have um, audience members will be able to ask questions using the raised hand feature or um, putting it in chat uh, for us to read or, and share. But as I mentioned earlier, we have invited as our facilitator and discussant Dr. Lionel Kimball, who is a, an associate professor of history, um, of history and Africana studies, both at Chicago State University. He received his PhD from the University of Iowa and primarily focuses on Afri African American labor politics in Chicago during the New Deal and the World War II era. His first book, A New Deal for Bronzeville Housing, Employment, and Civil Rights in Black Chicago. 1935 to 55, was published by Southern Illinois University Press. Aside from his teaching and research, uh, Professor Kimball is the former Vice President for Programs for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. He is a lifelong Chicagoan who focuses, whose work focuses on African American labor and politics, um, as I said, during the Depression, New, New Deal, and World War II eras. Professor Kimball, you have the floor. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the BMRC for the opportunity to participate in this talk today. Um, full disclosure, Brandon was a, a former student of mine at Chicago State, and we are so very proud of all of the things that he's doing. And I see it, that's a number of my friends and colleagues, Jacoby and Richard Courage and other folks who are on, on the call today. And, and I, I know Jacoby, uh, uh, Dr. Williams is really taking care of, of, of uh, Brandon down there at IU. So um, I think what I what I wanna wanted do first is just give some 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 comments on, on Brandon's talk. Um, I, I would echo what we were seeing in the chat that this is a, a, a very important piece um, of research that he's, he's undergoing here. I think that um, there's been this, this genuine push over the past 15, 20 years or so to really talk about and really reconceptualize what housing meant in and on the South side. Um, I think Brandon is really following in the footsteps of people like Arnie Hirsch, who was one of the, you know, first, you know, modern scholars to talk about the development of public housing and 
race and in 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 uh, slum clearance and all these particular policies. And I think that it was uh, also fortuitous for him to have a conversation with uh, Brad uh, early on in the, in this conversation. So what I what I want to do, I want to I want to pose a couple of questions first uh, to Brandon, and hopefully we can use these as a springboard to talk about other issues. I think I think initially what 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 drew my interest to this particular talk was um, Brandon's work on the intersection of class and, and race. I was I was trained as a as a labor historian, working class historian, and one of the things within our field is always this, this tension um, to which really takes primacy over in, within the study of black history, you know, race or class. It does, you know, and I think most of us who, who look at the racial aspect of working class history, we say that race always trumps class, right? Race within the community and how, and how the community operates and th thinks about activism always is much more important than this class analysis. Until we get to, Intersection of race and class within the black community, right? And I think it becomes much more complicated as far as the worldview. And I, I think the first question is, Brandon, in, in your initial research, how do you see some of the tensions between between the black middle class, the black the working class, and, and, and the black so called underclass, as you mentioned in, in your proposal? How do you how do you see this this tension developing? Well. well. In, in in my initial research, I, I I do a lot of like oral I do a lot of oral history, so I interview people who who lived in both, and I was interviewing a woman who lived in Lake Meadows, and she talked about how she uh initially this is this is this is a great thing. So initially, she lived in uh, her family was one of the first family that moved into Ida B. Wells, and initially Ida B. Wells was very uh, working class. You know, there's a lot of professionals, a lot of, you know, taxi drivers, you know, custodial workers, a lot of, you know, two parent households. And she mentioned about how the change in that area, she said, well, it was it was all good until those, uh, you know, those like, people who are on like public assistance came in and people who are people, you know, unwed mothers. And she said, that's when everything, you know, came down and that's when it was got destroyed. And then when she became an adult and she moved to Lake Meadows, she was just like, oh, it was a reprieve. I got, I got the, I got, I was around people who were like me, and I'm thinking, I'm like, what makes, and I, and I was asking, I was like, okay, what was the difference between, you know, you, and those, those two people, and she told me, well, like we, we had, we had, we had class, we, we, we knew how to act around people, and and, when, and during my research, I'm saying that a lot of people that I've talked to who are in the black middle class, and what I've read comments of people from the black middle class. Is more of like, I was able to achieve this. I came from the same place as you, and I can't. And I, if I were able to achieve this, how can you do that? And it's a lot of kind of bootstrap capitalism that became, you know, popular with you know Nixonian uh, rhetoric and into like Reagan uh, welfare queen, and it, and it, and a lot of black middle class figured like you know, I've I've achieved this through hard work, and they ignore like there are a lot of programs that you benefited from a lot of like the fair fair housing act and yeah, the housing clearing act that you benefited from that others through you know conservative rollbacks of a lot of these civil rights victories that you you, you don't see that there there's there's an interconnection to you like they, they may not discriminate against you because you're black now but because of your your, your wealth can only clear you so much before race becomes an issue. So that was, that's initially what I find I found. Yeah, I think I think that's interesting because I mean one one can take the cynical approach is that the black middle class to some degree buys into the the idyllic white meaning of what it means to be middle class, right? Even without the the necessary resources to really understand what middle middle classness means in the in the United States. And I also think that you're you're really onto I, I, I'm just so fascinated about it. I, I think you're really onto something because I mean there's another story, the story of the Rosenwald building, which is really telling the same story, right? In the 1920s of ours providing housing for for the black middle class. Um, but also I want to turn attention to to someone else who who comes 
comes up in your talk. And that, that person is Elizabeth Wood, right? Wood, I, I think, and you've probably noticed this in your, in your reading, is a very, very interesting person, right? She's a, she's a, she's a New Deal liberal. Um, she's a, I think what we call her probably an integrationist. You know, she works very closely with Robert Taylor in the 1930s and 40s. Tell me a little bit more about, about her and um, her 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 role in, in in this this discussion these policies. Well, as Tom mentioned, like with my doing research with her initial being a first director of like the Metropolitan Housing Council and her advocacy and work there eventually leading to her to being the first executive secretary of the Chicago Housing Authority and her battles with. Uh, at the, at the time of Mayor Kearney in 19, Mayor Kinsley, I'm sorry, in the 1940s. And her, like, like you said, she is a very idealistic New Deal liberal, very, very Eleanor Roosevelt-ish in her approaches to, well, let's, we can bring in integrated housing to her role of uh, creating this kind of like, you know, rainbow type community, but, you know, where we can work together as long as we have like, we, we, what they would call, you know, American ideals of, you know, well, white ideals. You know, we I, we can integrate it as long as we're of, of this sort of ilk. You know, working class families. You know, father works, mother's at home for 1950s, leave it to Beaver type thing. And her and her ideals for community building, of you know, against uh, high rises. She was, you know, she was against high rises. She was like, these these are not of places for people to raise families. But if we look at like, like Meadows, Meadows is a high rise building and uh, plenty of families were able to raise there. So it was almost kind of her view, her, she had a kind of a narrow view of what it meant to be a family and what it meant to have integration. But when, when, when we look at the way they designed uh, the high rises in the CHA, you know, they were almost very, very, brickish, mm -hmm. dull colors, almost a lot of gates, a lot of fences, a lot of very, very prison-like. So I think she was right in CHA's vision for, for housing and how they were building high-rises. But I think Elizabeth Wood was very, she was very idealistic in what it meant and very narrow-minded in what it, what it meant and very, she didn't understand like the, the differences in cultural representations of, of how black people interact with each other, the communal nature of the African-American community. Mm -hmm. I think she's very naive on that point. Yeah, yeah I, I think I would tend to agree with you there. I mean, I think I think she was one, I think this very important figure in, in the study, but um, but I, I, I think I would probably tend to agree with your assessment. And I, I think you're really headed in the right direction is think, looking at construction of the, the two types of high rises, right? You have these, I think we can aptly call these these vertical penitentiaries, right? These ver these vertical concentration camps, for less, less, lack of a better term, <clears throat> along State Street corridor and the like. But we also see these white glass steel buildings up and down South Parkway King Drive, which really tells you something about. I think the, the way the houses looked really meant something to the residents there. Um, and I think I wanted one one last thing. You know, I was I was asked two questions, but I, I think in, in talking about it, I have a, I have another one, and it it, it kind of plays back to the first question I asked about uh, class. Um, I guess for for the for the audience, and this may be obvious to some folks who are online. So how do you, how do you deal with the changing definition the changing nature of class over time because it sounds like your your study runs a gamut from the 1940s until the 1970s do, do are you noticing that how people define class changes over time and if it does what it, how do you how would you characterize that change i'm noticing it there's a there's a change in occupation over time so there's a time where, you know, you're middle class or working class, you're a bus driver, you're a taxi driver, you know, you do, you work at a barbershop, you do, you, know, you may not own it, 
which you know you do you you have you have a you're a you're a day late you're a laborer you work in a factory you know that's considered middle class work but as i go through as we move into the 70s of so what's meant to be middle class what's meant to be upper middle class you know they're from from my research and inter interviewing families so when i went to these archives and i see i saw names i would i would google who these people were mm -hmm. yeah. and I would, I would, uh, I would try to see, okay, like, what are they doing now? Because, well, most of the people were there, you know, passed away. But I talking to their children who were, who lived in these apartment complexes, well, who lived in Lake Meadows, and these are people who their families was okay. My my father worked with on the barbershop, you know. Then I became a judge, mm. and I became, then I became a physician. Yeah. And and how that change and how that changes over time, or what what it meant to be like even the middle class became there became sectors you know levels to middle class you know there's there's the upper middle class and then there's kind of the lower middle class We're like okay we live in the same building but we don't we don't make the same income we don't have the same prestige mm -hmm. in our jobs and the the, the nature of what of what prestige jobs meant has changed I see in my research so like. Education level has changed. Like it's okay. It was okay to just have a nice high school diploma at the beginning. Now, it's like if you don't have, you don't have at least a master's. You know, what are you really educated? Are you are really a part of this kind of black elite? And even even view, the viewing of Lake Meadows now, Lake Meadows is now just a, a stepping stone. It's like it's where you where you go when you're starting off. But you know, once you once you really make it, then you're gonna move. You're gonna move farther north. You're gonna to move to the northern suburbs. You're gonna to move to uh, Winnetka. You're gonna to move to places like that. You're gonna to move to Naperville. Well, thank and you. It's sort of what uh, Mary Patillo talks about in her book, uh, Black Picket Fences. Of course, of course. Uh, that, that's all I have. So I, I think it's, we're, we reached a point in the in the program where um, we're open open the, the Q and A to to the audience. I think Allison, are you are you running? Yes. Okay. I've been checking. I just reminded everyone that you can raise your hand using the reactions feature or um, put a question in the chat if you wish, and um, we can read it out loud. So the floor is open. I believe Carolyn Calloway Thomas has a question. Unmute yourself and ask your question, please. I'm unmuted. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brandon, for, for your lovely presentation. Um, I, I'm curious about the proximity issue uh, with regard to class. And I would like for you to comment on the kinds of people who are occupying the Meadows complex and all the other complexes. That is, those individuals who are present in the Meadows complex before they flee and go somewhere else. What is that situation like? And what is the impact of that situation upon the lived experiences of the people? Okay. Well, from, from my research, I saw there were a lot of professionals that moved into Lake Meadows, uh, lots of teachers, eventually like doctors, very few working class people, you know, bus drivers, uh, people uh, who are taxi cab drivers, barbershop owners, things of that nature. And in comparison to like the Daryl homes, from the data that I have, uh, like 85% were single parent households led, led by women, an average of 2.5 to three children, whereas in and the uh, Lake Meadows is one, one and a half children. And from the, also from the data that I got from the census tracts, the, the majority age group that were in Lake Meadows was from the ages of 25 to 49. Mm -hmm. And the majority ages in Daryl Homes was under 19. Mm -hmm. So you have one area where it's uh, lots of children. And in, 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 in Lake Meadows, you have the majority of people there are working age adults. So that, that you see like that right there skews the economic. Now you have a, 
a large percentage of working adults versus school age children in one area. So that's gonna skew the economic data and skew how, who lives there and what's available there. Great, oh, I'm sorry. Was there a follow-up, Carolyn? Well, I, I'm just mindful of having heard a young man who had come from the Chicago area indicate that he he had not seen one professional person in his community. So that was a motivating reason for my question. And I and we know that capital follows, you know, professions. And so I was just wondering whether there was a lot of work that you were doing in that regard. So thank you for your answer. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Courage has his hand up and has had it up for a little bit, and then I'll get to you, Valerie Grimm. Hi, nice to be here. We're having a little trouble hearing you. Richard, Richard, try turning your video Richard. off. Try, yeah, maybe turn, turn your video off. off and ask your question. That may work. Okay. okay, let's do this. If you, Richard, I'm sorry, but if you could type your question in the chat, and for now, I'll okay. I'll go. I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. Valerie Grimm, you had a question. Unmute yourself, Valerie Grimm. Thank you. There you uh, go. It's so it's so rarely that someone uses my whole name. I haven't trouble recognizing who you who you're talking to. That's funny. But anyway, um, thank you for the presentation, uh, Brandon, and also um, Allison for your organization arranging this this conversation. Um, and to you, to Professor Kimball, for your comments, because they made me think a lot about how we tell that the story of housing in Chicago. And Brandon's your conversation with this woman who talked to you about being in Ida B. Wells house, then moving into another place, feeling like she had moved up. So it's, that conversation kind of reminded me of how important, let's say, moral values and beliefs are. In the, in, the, in the space that come to form the climate and culture around housing. And so one of the things I'm very interested in, in knowing is, is how you um, are teasing out this conversation, you know, more about race, because I think you started about saying how race and class divided, um, was a housing in Bronzeville, did I get that correctly? Um, um, yeah, I thought that's what I heard you say. I could, I could be missing it. But so, so one of the things I heard from the woman's comment was this kind of internal, um, internalized sort of class and racist thinking about Black people. And that is the, the kind of people she thought didn't meet the standard for how she wanted to, to live. But I, 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 I want you to kind of flush that out more in, in, in helping us understand how this kind of internalized feeling of um, class and racism impacted the way that people got along in these living spaces. Because that's to me is the humanist subject, but also um, has a tremendous impact on how people think about whether or not to support public policies that, that help black people with housing in the sense that they aren't going to do anything but tear them up or they're not going to keep them well they're not going to be well kept that's what i'm kind of interested in the internal dynamics if you're able to do that right okay. now yeah. Do research. Yeah, I, I, yeah i can do that right now because i've as part of my research i'm conducting oral history so i'm interviewing a, lo a lot of people and in in these discussions Kind of like the, the internalized uh, internalized racism, I think you're bringing up mm -hmm. uh, internalized uh, anti-blackness. Yes. Yeah. So, 
what I'm hearing from these conversations are a lot of people, they view like, there's like segment, they, view, they, they segmentize like blackness and, and, and black community as a whole. And they, and they view like, there's a certain class of people who behave this way, a certain class of people who behave that way. And it's, a, and it's kind of like uh, almost an eternalized, there's always a gaze. And I only want to talk about like the white gaze, but it's just an, an eternalized gaze of like, I don't want people of my, of my ilk, of my class level to believe that I'm a part of this. And it's kind of like, um, um, it's a way of almost uh, black policing or class policing within the black community. It was like, okay, this is a certain level of which of where, where we, have arrived and we are never going to go back to that other level. It's kind of when I when I do research on the Great Migration, you can you can see it in the, uh, what Robert Abbott was putting in the Chicago Defender when you have like letters saying, okay, for new arriving ma migrants from the South, you know, you're not gonna be loud on, on public transportation. You're not gonna wear scarves on your head outside. Your children are gonna be this way. Your children are gonna act that way. You know, we're gonna dress according to this code. So it's something that's kind of been enforced and when of, of, of almost kind of like policing the black community, but separating yourself from things that you feel embarrass you, like kind of like the, the minstrelsy of, of the past. And like, we, we don't wanna, and it goes to kind of how caricatures and stereotypes of black people have become internalized and like I don't I've, I'm trying to run away from this so anything that reminds me of that I have to fight viscerally so that, that's what that's, that's what I've been seeing it's like it's almost things that are, and, and these are memories and uh, ideals that are that are passed down like we have to erase ourselves from the past erase ourselves from our, from culture, even things that are not that we, that we would, as as uh, academics, as people now would not consider it like, you know, children playing outside and being loud. That's that's how children are. But, you know, people are internalizing things from the past, from being kind of ashamed of uh, culture, from from especially an a shame of Southern culture, of like being outside, being spirited. Of, of how of how we of how blacks act in church, there there's a lot of it, a lot of that, in, especially in northern churches. Like we don't do what they do in the south. We don't. We're not allowed. Like ah, go uh. no, no. We're very pumped up. We listen to the preacher. They sing one song and we go home. That's that's not a, that's that's not going on. We're not. And it's a kind of a trying to escape an an, an internalized stereotype that's not really real, but has become real. Kind of like race. Race is biologically not real, but it's become real because of social, economic, and political forces. I don't know. I mean, I see it a little bit different, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I think Val, Val, if I was a Valerie Lionel, uh, if I could, I, ha, I, fi, I find it kind of problematic to call it anti-Black policing because, you know, I, I think there's this tendency to really reject what, what uh, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham and 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 those folks, uh, Elizabeth Clark, Clark Lewis, and the whole respectability politics, right? And I I wonder if we're getting to a point within the field in which we see this this overall rejection of respectability and ideal respectability politics that we're very quick to 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 say. Well, these folks have internalized white racism, right? And I think we would never make the argument that Ida B. Wells has internalized anti-black racism when she talked, when she, you know, or people or or Fannie Barrier Williams and 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 those folks who who are saying that there's a certain way we behave in public, right? Um, so I, I I mean I don't know I just see I see a little bit different, and and I also think but but Brandon I think in Valor, I think I think what what is important is that this this woman who you interviewed was giving her definition of what blackness was, right? And I, and I think it's dangerous for us to say that there's this one universal blackness, right? We, on the one hand, we say, well, these people out there being there, they're living their best life as you know, the kids say they're living their best life. 
is authentic blackness. But conversely, we can say that these folks who are trying to define what it meant to be black, you know, in in Chicago before these new migrants or whatever these newcomers to the neighborhood came in, you know, why are we so quick to to dismiss their definition of blackness, right? It's 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 a I think it's a fun intellectual game to play, but I think it's it's one that's that's incredibly important, you know. Can I just ask a, a follow up to that because I hear what you're saying, Lionel, and I hear what Brandon is saying. And I think what I'm trying to get at is, and I agree, there's no monolithic blackness yeah. in, in any way. But I do know, having studied history as well, that there are certain perception and false narrative that stick. Mm-hmm. And those perception of inferiority, those, those, those perceptions of not being culturally um, uh, adequate are ones that have stuck in a lot of places as far as we are concerned. My, my larger question is trying to understand what is the intersection of those perception and, and public policy as they relate to oh, the development of, of, of housing for black people. Okay. When yeah. I read about Chicago and other places on redlining, the reason some of that redlining was happening, the reason some of those, um, what they call um, one-on-one contracts that were being established uh, with black people in order to, for them to buy housing, I think a lot of that grows out of this perception that if you build, if you develop a black space, people tend to want to think that it's going to be a certain kind of way. I think Brenda mentioned it kind of like it's going to become a ghetto, but they don't make those assumptions about anybody else. So yes. I agree with what you're saying that there, there are no monolithic blackness. Okay. Yes. Okay. Valerie, thank you for your input. We are running close to our closing time and I want to get this last question in. Um, Gentleman Richard Courage, who is one of our former fellows, attempted to early uh, speak with us, but his audio was not working. So Brandon, uh, Richard is saying, "I, I wondered how the Rosenwald building might fit into this historical narrative. Was it a forerunner of Lake Meadows? I wouldn't consider it. Well, you could consider it a possible forerunner, but with the weight, with the narrative of like in Lake Meadows and its integrationist uh, kind of like outset of of slum clearing. And I I don't know, there's something that I I may have to punt to uh, Dr. Kimball on this because I I only have like, like uh, very skeletal uh, info on the Rosenwald building. Mm. Where there, I, I, I would make the argument that it was part of this, this, this trend, right? I think there's these two competing, you know, maybe two, two competing forces, you know, one is to provide, you know, the thought to provide this housing for low income and working class people. But there's also was this movement early in the 19, the, the 1920s to provide privately funded houses and homes for middle-class black people. I think all under the guise of keeping, trying to keep the middle-class, I think one of the points I wanted to bring up today is keeping, this stuff is, in my estimation, designed to keep middle-class black people in black neighborhoods as opposed to letting them move into middle-class white neighborhoods. I mean, I think it's, that's that's very obvious, I think, you know, but, um, there was this push by Julius Rosenwald, and I think there was, there was a, a competing uh, project. I think it was Carnegie under him, in New York City doing the same thing. These 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 these, these capitalists building these homes for middle class black people, and I think the Rosenwald was one was one of these things. And people who lived in the Rosenwald, this was seen as a very an, an exclusive community to live in, you know. So I, I would make I would probably make the argument that yeah, the Lake Meadows and Prairie Shores were just an extension of those types of you know, development that we saw in the Rosenwald. Okay, thank you. We are at time and I want to thank Brandon um, for your presentation and all the work that you Mm -hmm. did to be able to um, share with us all that you have today. We uh, here at the BMRC were delighted to have you as um, a fellow this summer, impressed with your work, 
interested in keeping up with you and hearing about uh, your continued success uh, with this line of research and on from there. So thank, we wish thank you, you all the we wish you all the best, and we know you'll keep in touch. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, so. The website will be up. I'm developing it. I have web developers, so so you, okay, it'll be visually so you, beautiful and informative. Oh, be sure to let us know. We'll put a note in the newsletter to let our followers know. And uh, thank you, Professor Kimball, for uh, helping us to to see the importance of Brandon's work and to guide us with a um, or guide us into this discussion today. Thank you all for participating. If you're, if anyone is interested in learning more about the fellowship program with the BMRC, um, please do reach out to, um, well, check us out online and you feel free to reach out to me uh, individually if you have particular questions, et cetera.